for those of you that, who don't know me, my name's Robbie. I work at, uh, as a web developer at Kathmandu. And uh, seeing as we're talking about translations and Silverstripe, I'm going to talk about Fluent, which is the other um, alternative. So, what is Fluent? Um, it's basically the same thing as translatable, but it's written by one of the other principal developers of Silverstripe, possibly in a sort of a competitive way, I'm not sure. Um, and it does a slightly different thing. So um, the main difference, as Matthew said earlier, is that Translatable will give you different site trees entirely. Fluent doesn't do that. It gives you one site tree um, deliberately with the ability to localize <coughs> parts of the page or a whole page or you know things like that. But you maintain the site tree that you have. It's just one, one entity between all of your translations. So um, I asked Damien, Damien Moyman, who's the author of the module, I said, um, why did you create it? Um, this was his answer. <laughs> he says, Fluent was designed so that you could localize what you wanted when you wanted. The existing solutions couldn't and didn't attempt to address this need. They only allowed users to trade more effort for value in a disproportionate rate. <laughs> So I think what he's getting at there is that um, depending on what you want to achieve, like you know, as Matthew said, what he's doing works well for his use case. For um, for us at Kathmandu, we didn't want that. We wanted one site tree. Uh, we wanted to be able to change certain parts of it when, when we needed to without duplicating um, things if we could avoid it, um, and try and keep it as simple as possible in terms of the uh, the user interface. So that's my rough translation. Of what he said there. So, what makes Fluent different? I've probably already touched on that, but we'll go through it again. Um, so, you do have a base language. Well, you've got a base locale anyway. Um, so, a certain dialect of the language is going to be your base language, and it normally would fall back to what the Silver Stripe default is, which is uh, tends to be the United States. Um, so when you create content, it always is based in that language, and when you don't have translated content, it always falls back to that language. So um, the next point is, it's also the same with translatable, but we translate by locales, not necessarily by the language itself. So you could have three or four variations of English, uh, or you could have the same amount of variations of Spanish, and they could all be completely different uh, sets of editable content rather than having an English website and a Spanish website. Um, so one of the important points here is that you maintain the same page. And the example of the page is that you have one page. If you want to change part of the page, you do, and it stays as one page. So um, even if your URL segments change, it's still the same page, and it's still the same ID. Um, and that was, I think, one of the key points of this module, is to keep everything um, in terms of the data integrity, keep it sort of in one place and you know nice and simple, or relatively simple anyway. So, what would he say to the to the same question? However, I define its benefits by what it doesn't over what it does. It doesn't force you to manage multiple data sets. You have a single tree, not one for every site, and every piece of information is visible to you. So that's quite an important point there. Um, simplicity, essentially. It doesn't violate data model integrity, e.g. every page has exactly one ID. It doesn't require any special effort to migrate an existing site tree when adding Fluent to a project. It doesn't have a CMS interface for adding locales, and it doesn't have localized permissions. I might possibly suggest that having localized permissions could be a good thing, but um, you, know, you don't necessarily need to be able to add locales because they are, I think, inherited from the underlying framework anyway, so possibly isn't that relevant. So um, we may as well have a bit of a look and see what it looks like to um, install and use. So um, you probably can't see this. Uh, just a simple proposal required tractor car is Damien's handle. Uh, silver stripe fluent and uh, I'm connected to my Wi-Fi. Bear with me. 
seem that I'm saying interesting things. The annoying thing is it's going to come from the cache anyway. There it is. Right. So, to get set up with this, it's normally pretty straightforward, pretty fast, and easy to do. So, um, you basically do it all through YAML. It's a good size there. Get rid of that. It's my dinner order. Um, so, when this is installed, you basically take the example uh, YAML configuration that it comes with, you strip out all the stuff you don't need, and only change the parts that you do need. So by default, it's going to localize anything that extends from site tree. Um, so the majority of what you actually need to do is done just with a basic installation. Um, it's taking a sweet time. <laughs> Not very good at dancing, so I won't do that. Here we go, it's doing something. So, um, I may as well talk about our use case. The reason we chose Fluent over Translatable at Kathmandu is because we come from uh, an, a Magento environment where you can basically change a locale for an entity and change a certain part of its information without needing to duplicate it, uh, any of it. So, um, look at that. Three, four minutes just to load from the cache. Anyway, so um, we wanted to be able to keep the consistency for the interface for the people that are editing our content. So they have a thing in the top left corner which they select their locale and um, they change where they need to rather than changing all the time. So if we take a look at the fluent configuration, just copy it for now and we'll create a new one. We'll call it uh, My Fluent. Put it in there and tell it to run after Fluent config. So we can strip a lot of this out. So because all this is already set by Fluent, we, we don't actually need a lot of it. So we'll get rid of the default. I'm just going to say New Zealand's good. Um, I'm going to take oops, New Zealand and Spanish. Get rid of them. Aliases are, <clears throat> so the way that Fluent works with the different uh, URLs is basically it either adds uh, the locale code into the URL or it, you can configure it to run on different domains if you have different domains. So for the example's sake I'm going to use um, the URL part and this lets you set um, an alias for that so it'll come up as en or es in the URL instead of ENZ which is a bit more friendly. Um, <clears throat> talking quickly about these fields, so this defines what Fluent is going to look for when it's translating things. So um, basically, the data include part is any field that you add to a data object that is of that type, as long as the, the object is fluent, is going to be naturally translated. So it, you can see there's text bar char, HTML. So that means any text bar char or HTML field in a translatable object is going to be immediately translatable. So you can add in integers and um, there's an example there, you can add in a foreign key or you could add in, well, if you add in a foreign key, it's going to make every single relationship in the entire um, architecture translatable, which can be handy. Or you can do it specifically um, by certain kinds uh, within your, your own YAML configuration, you can specify that you want um, a blog page to have a localized featured image ID, for example, and then that only that one will be uh, changeable. So you can also add in, for example, we have markdown. So we have markdown as one of our um, included fields, um, uh, data types, sorry. And then the field <coughs> here, same sort of thing, the specific types of fields that are included and excluded. So that being said, get rid of it. Get rid of search because I'm not going to use it for the example. I've got a bunch of settings here and I won't go through them all. They all do slightly different things. And the fluent configuration, default locale there. Same way as translatable, you need to remove the um, default calls that come up in your configuration for this. 
get rid of that and just let Fluent do it. And we'll get rid of that as well. So basically we end up with a reasonably simple configuration here. Um, we will run a build. And while that's happening, we'll just look at an example. So basically what I want to do is say, I'm going to create a new page that's going to be in English and in Spanish, or in New Zealand English and Spanish anyway, and we'll localize it, we'll change the site name maybe as well, just for the sake of the demo. Um, <clears throat> while we're here, um, <clears throat> talking about the database, so basically what it does is it takes any field in a, in a data object that is translatable or localizable or fluent or whatever you want to call it, for example the page name or the title, uh, and it will add a new column to the table for each of the locales, which is nullable. Um, so if you set it at a locale, it will fill the field, and if you don't, then it's null, and it will augment any SQL queries that look up those objects to look first for the locale, uh, the locale field, and if it doesn't find it, it will just go back to the default. So you do end up with a whole lot of extra fields, but you don't end up with a whole lot of extra uh, duplicated records and tables and stuff like that. You end up with more columns but less tables, which can argue be a good thing. So you can see from the build, these are all the fields that it's created. Basically, uh, um, actually this isn't really very good size, is it? Let's make it a bit smaller. There we go. So you can see it's created a whole lot of localized fields for site tree because site tree is the one that is currently uh, fluent. Not doing Max any favour there, am I? So here's your locale selector on the top left now. So you've got the ones that we defined in the config. Um, and you've got over here an indicator telling you which locale you're editing in which is um, a reasonably new feature. It's just handy because if you create a page in a non-standard locale, it can do some difficult things and you have to go into the database and hack it up to make it work again. So, um, let's go and say, first of all, change the site name. Uh, so, we'll call this NZ site. Let's the demo. And then we'll change to Spain. And we'll call it uh, Spanish site. I don't speak Spanish, so I'm not going to follow. So, um, <clears throat> as you can see, this little in indicator here is telling you that uh, it? it has been modified from the default value. Um, so that's it's good when you're talking about certain parts of the page being changed. Uh, you can see which ones have been changed, and you can just click on it and reset it, uh, which is quite handy. So, we've changed the name of the page, that's good. Now we'll go and change the page. So I'll just take one of the pre predefined pages, we'll go about us, we'll say, um, this, we'll start with New Zealand. Um, this is some NZ content. And then, start. Some Spanish content. That's the extent of my Spanish knowledge right there. So, um, put this at the front end. You should see the New Zealand because it is the default locale. And you see it's added the end to the URL. If you change this to ES now, you should see the Spanish equivalent. Um, likewise, you can also change the URL segment. Um, so you could say, uh, I don't know. Hola. Save that. You now have um, Hola and the URL instead, but we're still talking about one single page, which is something that we wanted and can and do, uh, which is why we've gone with this module. So it's a very basic uh, introduction. There is also an extension that you can apply, which will let you filter entities by locales as well. <clears throat> so if you don't want the contact page in Spain, you can go to a tab and you can say, I don't want it in Spain, and then it just won't show up. 
So um, that's that's there as well, and that's just a case of adding another extension to the same the page of the site tree. Or uh, yes, so um, maybe a more specific example. Let's add in in GB. We're adding in a uh, British one, um, and we'll use an example where possibly you might have some content that you want to change, but not all of it. Uh, where this module might be more useful over, say, translatable. <laughs> Alright, so... Let's say, for the sake of an example, I'm going to have a page that sells pants. Trousers versus NZ, please buy my pants. The URL change to. Of course, if you add in the locale switcher, then this would be automatic rather than um, happening like this. Please buy my pants, New Zealand site. That's my fault. I put an E in instead of NZ as the alias. So that's why it didn't work. Right, so. Back to here, and we look at what it looks like, and we've talked a bit about why we want to do it. So, stability and limitations. So, first and foremost, it's not an officially supported Silver Strike module, which is probably going to turn a lot of people off straight away as uh, when you compare it with Translatable, which is. Um, it does have some pretty good community involvement on GitHub. There are a few people that are quite active in um, contributing to it. Um, at the moment, it's mostly in terms of adding new features as opposed to fixing bugs. But yeah, there are, there's a good sort of amount of support there. Uh, it is written by one of the principal developers of Silver Stripe, which is a good thing. Um, and he has a reasonable amount of passion for this module, so hopefully he keeps supporting it. Uh, the one downside I would say is that it can have problems when you're dealing with other modules that use extensions. For example, um, let's go back because I want to talk about that. So for example, the way that Fluent works is that the extension you apply goes and takes all of the fields on a model and makes them or finds out if they're translatable and if they are then it returns them. That means that it has to be the last extension to run. Um, so if you have other modules that are adding fields to a model, uh, to a data object, and they don't happen before the Fluent module runs, then they aren't necessarily going to be translatable. And you have to do some kind of like little hacky things to work around that. So that is one problem with this module. It's also not necessarily that common for that to happen. Um, <coughs> for example, like the blog module, right, it defines a complete new data object in its own and it uses the before update CMS fields callback, which is what you need to do to make it compatible with Fluent. So that's fine. But 
if you then had another blog module that used an extension adding another field to the blog page, that wouldn't be translatable because you know it's it's like Fluent and this other extension are competing for priority there, and it's not guaranteed that Fluent's going to win. So um, I said to Damien, what would you do basically if you could snap your fingers and have anything right now for this module? He said, reliability, user confidence, clarity, and cross compatibility with other modules. So um, you know, I think that especially because it's not an official module, you know, you need to have you need to have um, a reputation for it being stable and reliable and confident and have public confidence in it, otherwise people are not going to use it. So, he says, Fluent as a feature set is complete, but it needs to be able to cope with data sets of various sizes, non-standard user interaction, and stability when integrated with other modules. So, I came up with a highly theoretical problem that this module would encounter. So um, in MySQL, if you're using either of those two storage types, which you're guaranteed to be using one of them, probably the latter, you have uh, limits on the number of uh, rows or the size of the rows that can be um, can take up before it's going to start throwing huge error messages at you whenever you try and do anything. So um, if you take the InnoDB example where you have a maximum of 1,000 columns, if you have 50 fields and 20 locales, you then have um, 1,000 columns. And you're getting really close to that limit. And it, obviously that's a huge um, data object, but you know, it's a theoretical example. So that is one downside to the way this is structured, because it adds all those extra fields. You, know, you can potentially reach a limit like this. And when that happens, what you need to do is break it up, obviously, into manageable extensions or, you know, literal PHP extension classes or silk stripe extensions so that you don't have so many fields and then those fields are going to be stored in different tables instead of the one table. Um, obviously theoretical of course but possible. Um, so to recap, it's fast to set up, install and configure if you're not using Macs and don't have um, broken Wi-Fi. Uh, works by locale, not necessarily by language overall. Um, we retain the data integrity is probably the most important point. So you have one data object versus a copy data object, if that's what you want. And if you don't, then use translatable. Um, and it works with anything. I didn't really talk about that, but you can apply Fluent to any, any data object as you can with translatable as well. For example, we use it with Elemental um, for you know, widgets and stuff like that. And you can translate the widgets in a page, and you can filter them in a page. And, change the content in a, in a, within the page's context and yeah, you can really make anything that is stored in the database for it, so that's good. And uh, yeah, that's it, so the link's at the bottom there if anyone wants to check it out.